Hello space fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, nanoprobes to the stars, Kepler has a glitch and then comes back, and Europa may have more liquid water than previously thought. So I guess the big news this week came from a project I had actually never heard of, Breakthrough Starshot. Part of Breakthrough Initiatives, a broader effort that includes projects like Breakthrough Listen, which is a $100 million program of astronomical observations in search of evidence of intelligent life beyond Earth, Breakthrough Message, which is a $1 million competition to design a message representing Earth, life, and humanity that could potentially be understood by another civilization, and Breakthrough Starshot is another, even more ambitious initiative. Also at $100 million, it is a research and engineering program aiming to demonstrate proof of concept for a new technology enabling ultralight unmanned spaceflight at 20% of the speed of light, and to lay the foundations for a flyby mission to Alpha Centauri within a generation. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, but I've never heard of this. So as I said, I had never actually heard of this until two days ago, and to say that I'm skeptical is understating things a bit. Now, they have a really impressive board, including Professor Stephen Hawking and Mark Zuckerberg lending their support in the venture. Now, Andrine, the wife of the late Carl Sagan, also showed her support because she was also at the press conference earlier this week. Funded by Russian billionaire Yuri Milner, these really ambitious and laudable initiatives sound really great, and on the surface, I support all of this. I'm a big fan of rich people using their money to fund their own space programs and research endeavors. So I say, good on him. So the proof, of course, will be in the implementation. Will this really get off the ground and do something even remotely close to what they hope to do? Of course, it's too early to tell, but the idea of sending small nanoscale probes out into interstellar space by pushing them with very powerful lasers is a very novel, if not politically challenging, way to explore our nearby stellar neighborhood. Now, the plan is that these probes can be accelerated to 20% the speed of light using a ground-based kilometer-scale laser array capable of beaming 100 gigawatt laser pulses through the atmosphere for a few minutes at a time. So the idea goes something like this. There will be this barrage of photons hitting this very, very light sail. And with each photon that hits it, there will be a transfer of momentum onto the sail and its cargo. And the more of these photons that hit it over time, the faster the spacecraft goes, and it gets it closer to Alpha Centauri. And the idea would be that they would get there in less than a generation. Now, by comparison, the spacecraft we already have on the way to other stars, the Voyager probes, for example, would take more than 30,000 years to travel the 4.37 light year distance to our nearest star. At 20% of the speed of light, the nanocraft could get there in about 20 years. Now, they wouldn't be able to decelerate, though, so they'd just whip by Alpha Centauri and take data as they pass and beam it back to Earth. Will they pull this off? I don't know. But I'm glad they're trying, and I certainly support the effort. Far be it from me to naysay something like this. At least someone is trying something. Now, as I said, this is a proof of concept program. So if it works, then great, because what they can then do is scale it up to something larger that may even include human trips to the nearest stars. My hunch, though, is that the real way to get to the closest stars in our galaxy is going to have to involve generation ships or something like it. At least that's just my personal opinion. But for nanoprobes, hey, this sounds great. Anyway, we'll see how this goes over the years, and of course, I will keep you posted. Next, on April 7th, NASA announced that the Kepler Space Telescope, which was rebooted as K2, was in emergency mode. They discovered the space telescope in this condition when it established contact with it prior to commanding it to point to the center of the Milky Way to begin a micro, a micro lensing survey. Now, emergency mode, or EM as they call it, is very fuel intensive because the spacecraft is designed to hold a specific attitude with respect to Earth, and it does so using its onboard thrusters and fuel. So getting it out of that mode was top priority. Now, before this happened, after the previous scientific run, which ended on March 23rd, the spacecraft was placed in something called the Point Rest State, or PRS. And while in PRS, the spacecraft antenna is pointed towards Earth, and it operates in a fuel-efficient mode with the reaction wheels, which is what keeps it pointed, at rest. So something happened after that to cause K2 to go into emergency mode, but mission engineers are still investigating what happened. 
Anyway, NASA announced on April 11th that K2 is out of emergency mode and seems to be operating nominally. And they are running the microlensing survey, as planned, called Campaign 9. Now, since the emergency mode began approximately 14 hours before the planned spacecraft maneuver to orient the spacecraft toward the center of the Milky Way, they don't think it was the reaction wheels or the repointing maneuver that caused it. But they are investigating the cause at the same time that they are running the microlensing event. Anyway, K2 is back in business. And what's interesting is that this is the only EM event Kepler has had in its seven-year mission. That's very remarkable and comforting for those of us worried about operating space telescopes like JWST, for example, in places where we can't service it. We're getting a lot of experience operating space telescopes for years, even decades, without repair missions. Now, finally, researchers from Brown and Columbia universities have run a set of experiments designed to understand how much heat is created when ice is deformed. And these experiments lend some insight into how a moon like Europa around Jupiter might behave under the strong tidal forces it undergoes as it orbits the giant planet. Europa is under constant gravitational assault. As it orbits, Europa's icy surface heaves and falls with the pull of Jupiter's gravity, creating enough heat, scientists think, to support a global ocean beneath the moon's solid shell. Now, these experiments suggest that this process, which is called tidal dissipation, could create far more heat in Europa's ice than previously thought. The work could ultimately help researchers better estimate the thickness of the moon's outer icy shell. Astronomers could tell by looking at Europa from very early on that something was going on here. The surfaces were not remotely like a cold, static place. Rather, it was easy to see that some sort of tectonic activity was occurring here. There were cracks and places where the ice looked smooth and kind of mushy. That's a technical geologic term, by the way. Mushy. <laughs> So, to see how much ice heated up as it was compressed and released, researchers put some ice in a compression device and subjected ice samples to repeated cyclical loads, similar to what exists around Jupiter. The best way to imagine how the heat is formed is by comparing it to the heat that's generated when you bend a coat hanger back and forth till it breaks. As you keep bending it, the wire gets hot. Well, the same thing here. The more you can compress and uncompress the ice, it heats up. And what surprised everyone wasn't that the ice heated up, but just how much it did. Way more than they thought it would. They don't think it's the cracks or the grains of sand and dust that are causing it that's embedded in the ice. Rather, the crystalline structure of the ice itself and the defects that form as the ice is deformed. So that means there may actually be more water under the icy surface of Europa than previously thought. Arthur Clark would be amazed. Well, that's it for this week, Space Fans. Thank you for all your support. And please like the Space Fan News page on Facebook to get a new series I'm creating called SFN Minute, where I cover short little stories that happened over the week that I think you might be interested in. So thank you all for watching. And as always, keep looking up. This is me messing with the teleprompter. Thank you very much. New silly technology. Yucca duty fruity rubber rubber rubber. Now they have a really impressive board, including Professor Stephen Hawking and Mark Zuckerberg. 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 <laughs> Relax. Just chill.